degree in college. Um, as you probably just heard, um, this webinar is being recorded, so you may or may not want to turn off your camera. Um, and with that being said, my name is Kristen, and I am a third year resident member at Green College, and I'm joined today by Liz. Hi all, my name is Liz and I am a first year resident at Green College. I moved here in December during the pandemic and hope to provide you with another perspective of the college and its community in our sort of new normal. So before we get started, we would like to recognize that Green College is situated on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam people. We also invite you to find some time today to reflect upon the traditional owners of the territories that you live and work on. And at this point, we would like to introduce our Green College principal, Mark Vesey, who has a quick welcome message for us. Thanks, Liz. Thanks, Kristen. Yes, welcome to Green College. This is as <laughs> close as you get for now, and it's great to, to see. Well, oh, 20, 20 something of you here and possibly others will join. Um, I've been principal of the college for a number of years now. And I think it must be a great place to live if you're a graduate student uh, or a postdoctoral fellow. Um, <clears throat> certainly if it's the right place for you to live as a graduate student or a postdoctoral fellow, it must be a terrific place to live. Why do I say that? Really only one compelling reason that I can offer you. <clears throat> and, and, and here it is. Every year there are about a hundred people living at the college. The great majority of them uh, graduate students at UBC uh, with a happy smattering of postdoctoral fellows and some other visitors. And at the end of the year, some of those people have to leave because they've graduated and they're going to get on with their lives. Um, some others have to leave because they've come to the limit of the time they're eligible uh, to stay at the college, which is usually determined by the length of the program they're in. And then everybody else uh, is offered a contract to renew their residency for the following year. And in any normal year, so that's like 26 or 27 after the last 27 or eight, I'm losing count, um, just about everybody given that opportunity to renew their contracts does. And among the few who don't, Lynn and I usually have a pretty good idea of why that is. And there are good and obvious reasons and only very rarely, like 1% one and a half percent of the time, I think, if we actually had solid statistics on this, do people not renew because they haven't enjoyed living at the college? So that's, I think, for a tribe-sized community of about 100, pretty good striking rate, and it suggests there must be reasons for living at Green College. And given that there are plenty of other nice ways to live in Vancouver, and even other pleasant places to live on the UBC campus, some of which you're probably reconnoitering actively, that seems to me uh, good grounds for believing there must be something good happening around the place. But I don't really know much more than that. I, in fact, and I think this is entirely appropriate for a principle of the kind of residence and the kind of community Green College aims to be, I know hardly anything about what really happens here. I put up a certain amount of smoke now and again just to ensure that um, outsiders to the college don't interfere with what people living at the college are actually trying to do. But as for what they're up to, and as for why they stay, and why they think anybody in their right mind would want to join them, well, luckily for all of us, Kristin and Liz are here. And I'm every bit as curious as I think you must be to hear what they say next. I'm gonna stand back now, in fact, I'll switch myself off, um, but I'm ready to provide um, information if I usefully can later on. And I suspect there will be questions about continuing availability of places at the college for next year, and possibly also about quarantining arrangements at UBC for people coming uh, from outside Canada. And I, I can say stuff about that, but let's leave that until uh, you've had the main course now, whether this is after breakfast for you, after lunch, after dinner, or I don't know, some kind of afternoon tea snack. Back to you, Kristen, Liz, thanks. Thank you so much, Mark, for those words. Um, so today we are going to start with some of the basics. 
where the college is, some of the buildings and the amenities available, what the individual room types are, um, some of which you can see in the back of my screen, um, before talking about the community here, the dining and the application process. And then after that, we are going to welcome any questions that you might have. So Green College is a really unique student residence, and you'll notice that it is called a college. That's because it is based on the system of student housing at Oxford and Cambridge. And in fact, our founder, Cecil Green, also helped found our sister college at Oxford, which is now known as Green Templeton College. So as you've likely already read, Green College is one of two residential colleges at UBC. The other college is St. John's. And St. John's emphasizes internationalism in the same way that we emphasize interdisciplinary conversations and ideas. As Mark alluded to, every year we've got about 80 graduate students, 15 postdoctoral scholars, and several visiting scholars that then call Green College home and together create a really unique and vibrant academic community which is then aptly reflected in our motto, ideas, and friendship. So as you can see from this photo, Green College is absolutely beautiful um, and about as close to living in Hogwarts as you are probably going to get here in Canada. So in addition to your room, you've got 24 seven access to two heritage buildings for study and recreation, the common kitchen, laundry facilities, and extensive grounds featuring a community garden. So where is Green College anyway? Well, Green College is situated on the north side of UBC campus, surrounded by trees near trailheads to Pacific Spirit Park, minutes from Tower Beach and about a mile and a half away from Spanish Banks. Now, Greenies often frequent Wreck Beach, Tower Beach, Spanish Banks for swimming in the summer after dinner. Um, and sometimes we'll do polar plunges in the winter, particularly on New Year's. Um, I will note that tower and rec beaches are clothing optional. So be aware of that if you all come visit. Um, Green College is also about a five to 10 minute walk from the bookstore, the main libraries and the bus loops, which then can get you to downtown Vancouver in about 45 minutes. So here's a map of our specific Green College campus, where we don't just have the residence buildings, which we've got here, um, but we also have Common Kitchen, the office, and the three more social buildings. So to that end, Kristen is going to go through some of these buildings and their amenities. Yeah, so as Liz mentioned, one of the benefits of living at Green College is access to a, a wide range of facilities in addition to your residence room. I'm just going to go over those. So the Graham House is the largest heritage building at the college. I believe it's over 100 years old. The first floor includes a piano lounge featuring a grand piano and a working fireplace, which is quite lovely in the winter. Um, this is a great place to study, read, in my case, do a lot of knitting, um, or play the piano if you're musically inclined. We also have a billiards room adjacent to the piano lounge. Now next we have the William C. Gibson room, which is a private dining room that residents normally use for studying and conducting committee business. And we also have the reading room which is our college library, and it holds books and periodicals from a variety of disciplines, some of them actually publications from residents and visiting scholars. Now, the second floor is our dining hall, which in a normal year is where you'd pick up your breakfast and dinner and either eat at the long table or elsewhere on the college grounds. In light of the pandemic, we are currently picking up our meals in the servery and um, taking them to go to eat in our rooms or outside. The Coach House is another heritage building. It's normally where we attend lectures and other events and uh, sometimes hold uh, resident only after parties for galas. 
We also have a residence only recreational room called Green Commons. It's not pictured in this presentation as it's currently closed to residents due to pandemic concerns, but it holds a TV with cable, gaming consoles, and a variety of puzzles and board games. In the past, we've had a lot of movie and TV marathons in this room. At one point, we were gathering every week for the final season of Game of Thrones and season seven of Brooklyn Nine-Nine. Um, and like I said, we can't really tell what the fall will look like, but we can hope that um, at some point we'll get use of this room again. Now the common kitchen, which we normally and lovingly call the CK, is where we make our meals for lunches and weekends, sort of those meals that aren't covered by the meal plan. It's equipped with common fridges, ovens, stoves, a microwave, in addition to other appliances. And um, there's also dishes and, um, you know, other uh, cooking, any, basically anything you'd need for cooking. Um, at this time, we are limiting the number of people who can be in the CK at any given time to six. Um, and both residents and staff sanitize it daily. If you opt to use the key CK, you can expect to have cleaning duty at least once a month. The CK is also where we do our laundry. Um, note the laundry machines are coinomatic. And on the recommendation of our sustainability committee, the college also um, offers environment friendly detergent strips. In addition, we have access to the college gardens and grounds, which include a rose garden, a really nice community garden, lots of grassy space for sports and picnics and a patio sitting area. Now back to the rooms. This is the exciting part. There are three basic room types at the college. The most common is a single room with an adjoining bathroom shared by two residents. The second is a split level room, which is shared by two residents, typically in their second year. Um, and so with a split level, the first level is a shared space and bathroom. And the second is a hallway and really nice reading nook with the two private bedrooms. The third is a studio room, which is generally reserved for postdoctoral residents, residents with partners and visiting scholars. And if you'll, you'll see in the picture, it does have a fireplace, which is really nice. Um, if you have any questions about room assignments, you can get in touch with the Green College office and they should be able to answer your questions. Now, residence fees vary from year to year, but include electricity, heat, hot water, internet, and even basic cable. We have a screenshot here of the um, most recent fees, which can be paid online via student portal or in person. Living at the college is a one of a kind experience. I can, uh, I can speak to that, so can Liz. Um, several times a, a week, the college hosts free public lectures and events from a diverse range of speakers, including current and emeriti UBC faculty, visiting scholars, activists, artists, and on Monday nights, a lecture series that allows resident members to share their research with their peers. Working, learning, and dining in this community that values diversity and active involvement You'll also have the opportunity to develop a lasting global network of friends and colleagues outside of your academic cohort, which I found very valuable. When I first came here, I didn't really realize just how warm and hospitable and interesting my neighbors would be. And I can't tell you how many lifelong friendships I've built here at meals and galas, welcome month activities, on walks to rain or shine ice cream, which will very quickly become your favorite ice cream place in the world. Um, at our friendly intercollegiate sports tournament with St. John's or just studying together around the fireplace in the piano lounge. After residency, resident members also become Green College Society members for life, joining a global network of former residents and associated faculty. 
Society members also have the opportunity to return to the college at reunions or at other social and academic events. So you might be asking uh, who lives at the college? What, what, what do residents look like? Well, for the most part, the college is made up of UBC students in master's or doctoral degree programs, but we also have postdocs in addition to a few professors, writers, artists, musicians, journalists, and other experts in their fields who stay with us for a term or so. Now, this representation is slightly dated, but it does reflect the normal distribution of types of resident members that make up our community. Now, um, the culture at Green College changes every year as people come and go. So word to the wise on a communal and individual level, your experience at the college is what you make it. There are tons of ways to get involved. Um, given that we're in a COVID-19 context, it might look a bit different from what we've done in the past, but just to give you an idea, traditionally involvement could look like attending events, being on a committee, acting in our spring play, performing at the coffee house, which is essentially our um, bi-monthly talent show, or sharing a niche hobby or interest with your neighbors. So as you can see, those last photos were taken before COVID. And our communal activities, of course, then look a bit different than years prior. So we're doing our best to have communal activities that stay well within the provincial health guidelines. And sometimes that looks like badminton on the lawn, uh, going down to read on Rock Beach, or uh, if you're me and in the photo on the right, training for a 10K. So the Recreation Committee also just got some new equipment for the outdoors, and that's something we're gonna be taking advantage of in these warmer months. So it was without a doubt quieter this round and certainly harder to make friends than years prior. You do have to make that extra effort to plan an outing, reach out to plan a walk to rain or shine and shine, but there still is a community. So when I signed up for the Vancouver Sun Run, that's the 10K, I wasn't alone. Three other people signed up and we met up weekly to just encourage each other during our run. And having those individuals, especially people outside of my department, help me stay grounded. So even though the pictures are a bit less than crowded than the ones that Kristen presented, there's still a community and an inherent value of having one. So hopefully the coming year will enable us to return to something more like what Kristen described, but even if it doesn't or if it's somewhere in between, being a part of Green College means that you have built-in friends that you can lean on when times get tough, and clearly this year. Or at the very least, people just to make sure you don't get locked out of your apartment. So while we don't know what the future holds, the community here is still one of the most valuable components of being part of Green College. And I know one that has made me feel less alone throughout all of this. So as um, Liz mentioned, one of the great things about Green College is um, and community life is that we have a well-developed infrastructure for supporting residents. First off, um, Green College staff are always happy to help with any questions and they're very helpful and nice. Um, every year we also have trained resident members who are able to provide anonymous support. If you need help navigating a social issue, finding resources for counseling, or you just wanna talk something out. We also have several committees designed to support resident members wellness and create extracurricular opportunities that support mind, body, and spirit. And we have um, a few of those listed here on this slide. So given the fact that we're now operating in a COVID-19 context, we want to highlight that we don't know what the future looks like, but we're going to give you a snapshot of what the meal plan looked like prior to the pandemic and what it looks like at the moment. So prior to COVID-19, we would have breakfast and dinner five days a week, which would consist of picking up your tray, selecting from a number of items on the salad bar, picking up your entree and either fruit or dessert, 
in addition to tea or coffee, juice or milk. You'd then take your tray over to one of the long tables and sit at the next available seat and have a conversation with your neighbor. Um, unless, of course, you are breaking off to sit at one of our language tables where you might only speak French or Spanish or Mandarin or at a book table club, a book club table. Um, there are also a few smaller tables and alcoves if you wanted to have dinner one on one with someone or uh, work on your laptop while eating. Also in good warm weather, oftentimes residents would bring their trays down to the outdoor patio and watch the sunset, which is really lovely. So obviously this looks different now, specifically not people crowded around a table. Um, so of course there's no communal dining strictly defined. Um, you receive a survey now in advance, about a week or so in advance about the planned meals and you make your selections. So there's like a meat option and a veggie option. And the kitchen, of course, does their best to accommodate any dietary restrictions or allergies that you might have. Then between six and seven, you pick up your box dinner as well as the breakfast for the next day in compostable containers and the, I guess it's called servery or great hall. And then during the summer, of course, some of us will take these trays out to the gardens and eat them socially distanced and outside. Um, but otherwise, it can often just be taken in your room. As provincial health orders change, so too, of course, might this system. Um, but for now, picking up food one at a time is ultimately the safest option. And here are the meal plan fees from 2018, 2019, to give you an idea of the cost. These are required to be paid at the first of each month and are separate from residence fees. This includes the five breakfasts and the five dinners that are prepared for you during the weekdays. Um, and if you're absent for, from the college for a certain amount of time, you can also apply for a membership fee reduction to sort of help offset those expenses. So is Green College the right fit for you? Well, as you can tell, uh, community is a big part of Green College. And if you are someone who is interested in engaging with others outside of your academic field and are eager to participate in community life, whatever that might look like next year, um, then chances are you are a great fit for us. And now that we've gone over a bit of what it means to be a greenie, what we affectionately call ourselves, it is time to get into the nitty gritty of actually applying. Um, before you can apply for admission to the college, you must first make sure that you're eligible, um, which means you've been accepted to UBC as either a grad student, postdoctoral fellow, or as a visiting scholar. Uh, presumably many of you here might have already cleared that barrier. Next stop is applying for UBC housing writ large, which entails a small fee and must be done before you can actually get to the specific green college application, um, which we'll cover in a second. So then if offered admission, of course you would accept um, and make sure to accept it by signing the contract with student housing and coordinate with the green college office about your move in date. Um, so we're now going to take a quick look at what that application actually entails. Um, apologies for those of you who are already experts in this, but just in case someone isn't, you do of course need to apply for residency here. Um, and that application has a few components worth just reiterating. So first, the application requires a personal statement of interest of no more than 500 words, where you show us why you are a good fit for Green College. This includes your interdisciplinary interests, extra activities that show you're an active member of the community, um, any experience living in a similarly communal environment, and you know, of course, why you're actually interested in becoming uh, part of the community here. You will also need to submit your academic CV or like a resume, um, much like the one you probably submitted for your UBC application as well as a personal letter of reference. So someone who can speak to you and your interests outside of an academic setting. Um, for instance, my former roommate wrote my letter of reference. Um, and of course, just make sure it helps if they look at the Green College website before they write one. 
So you also need to submit two academic letters of reference as well as your post-secondary transcripts. Um, do not really worry too much about that because your home department at UBC, um, should you have already been, of course, accepted to a home department, um, are able to forward them to the college as long as you ask them. So it's not something you have to ask your former professors for all over again. Um, your home department can forward them. Excuse me, forward them. Um, but that said, your application will not be reviewed by the membership committee until, you know, the whole package is complete. Now, these next two slides focus on some of the frequently asked questions. Um, the upshot of them is if you have not yet been accepted to UBC, um, but you hope to be or intend to apply, you can still complete the first step of applying for membership by submitting an application for student housing. Um, certainly crazy to someone who only was in the US institutions prior where you have to be accepted then do housing. It's actually recommended you do housing even before you apply to UBC. And of course, then when you're accepted to UBC and you went through the student housing, you can apply for Green College. Now, if it's been a long time since you've been in the academic world, um, two professional reference letters can also be accepted in the application if you lack recent academic reference letters. And when considering your plans to move to the college, note that your contract does not start until September 1st and that the move-in should be coordinated with the office, which is open during regular business hours, Monday through Friday. And all graduate students of all ilks are very encouraged to apply, um, both domestic and international. Uh, in fact, both Kristen and myself hail from the US. You can submit your documents at any time as the deadline is the 15th of each month, um, but it is ideal to submit them by March or April 15th for September 1st entry. Um, that said, submitting them later by the 15th of each month doesn't necessarily exclude you. And finally, you can apply to have a partner live with you, um, but they will need to submit an introductory letter um, then you will need to, or they will need to submit their own resume, CV, a personal statement like the one you submit, and a personal reference letter from a different referee than yourself and your own application. If they are already a graduate student, um, we recommend for them, we recommend that they apply separately for resident membership as their sort of own graduate student. Um, and unfortunately, children are not permitted to live here. Successful applicants for admission to Green College are also automatically considered for two different kinds of awards that can help offset some of the previously mentioned fees. The first, the R. Howard Webster Foundation Fellowship awards about $2,000 to $2,500 to 10 to 12 students per year. And the second, the NH Benson International Graduate Award awards $2,000 to one international student admitted to the college. Okay, um, this concludes our presentation at this point. We are very happy to take any of your questions. Um, and thank you for your, um, thank you for listening. <laughs> Um, you can also feel free to enter uh, your question in the chat or unmute yourself. Either is either works. Okay, so hi. Uh, hello. Hello. Thank you for this presentation. It was very helpful. So my question is, uh, I have two questions actually. So one is whether it's already decided uh, whether there will be a quarantine period in August in Canada and in case whether it can be spent at the Green College? I think this is a question that I might pass over to. Um, Tanya, do you have any information about that? Um, things are still quite fluid, but as of right now, there is still a 14 day isolation period required when entering Canada. 
Um, and in terms of where to do that, um, Green College, we, we just don't have the facilities and the space um, to accommodate the isolation period. So we, UBC does offer, we'll, we'll try to, we'll secure the link and put it in the chat for everyone, but UBC has a webpage that lists the process and where you can go. And um, we understand that they've formed some partnerships with local hotels as well. And that might be close closer to the airport so that students and anyone incoming that requires an isolation period can um, do that there. So I'll, I'll go and secure the link and put it in there for you. Thank you. Um, I see that Lena has a question. How is the hygiene in the kitchen managed? So um, are, are you, I'm guessing you're referring to the common kitchen or are you referring to the, um, the green college kitchens? Uh, not hearing an answer. So I'm going to assume it's the CK. Um, well, with the, yes, yes, the ones for weekend cooking. So with a CK, um, every morning we, um, the kitchen is cleaned by staff and sanitized and we have a roster. So two resident members will sanitize the kitchen um, each day. And in addition, we're of course being very careful to, um, you know, wash up after we're done cooking, um, make sure sometimes like to, um, you know, pre-wash dishes, dishes again. Um, yeah. Do you have anything to add to that, Liz? Um, I think that's primarily it. And I will say when we do talk about cleaning the CK, it's actually quite extensive um, with disinfectant, even for the microwave, um, as well as any high traffic surfaces. Um, and because we are not letting in more than I believe six people at once, it actually does manage to stay quite clean. Yeah, we're also not really eating in the CK or and we're trying to avoid just like lingering. So, um, you know, more people can use it at one time um, or yeah, just, just not lingering. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes into a related question. Um, is lunch not included in the meal plans? No, um, one of the best things to do for lunch ultimately is we have a few fridges, um, like sort of tiny ones that are helpful. Um, and of course, highly recommend getting your own sort of mini fridge to stock up on like microwavable meals. Um, we also in the common kitchen do have large fridges, fridges for everyone to use and put their meals in. Um, so people typically cook their own lunch. We're also very close to a, quite an, a fairly good assortment of food on campus as well that you're about 15 minute walk away from. Um, but unfortunately, yeah, it's not included in the cost. I see the next question is about maintenance fees. Um, I think maybe Tanya might be better suited to answer that question. Um. Maybe I can throw, throw it over to Mark uh, regarding maintenance fees. What was specifically the question? Um, I was a little confused about the maintenance fee that I think is part of the monthly expenses. Could you please shed light, some light on that? Is it in addition to the room fees and meal plan? Yes, I'm, I'm not sure what this, this is. We'd better find out what you've, what you've seen. Um, the, 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 the expenses are indeed the rent and the meal plan. And the way housing administers the rent, there is an upfront payment, which is a kind of security deposit, um, which uh, in the event covers your rent for the last six weeks of your annual tenancy. But I'm not aware of a maintenance fee in addition to any of those things. So um, if, if that came up on a slide somewhere, point us back to it and we'll, we'll try to explain that away because you're budgeting should really uh, only have to take account of the meal plan cost and the cost of your room rent and then anything else you choose to spend money on. Okay. Shall I answer this question about a wait list since I see it? Sure, go ahead. Um, 
This is from Gabrielle. Oh no, sorry, this is from Ratza. Um, we have a Gabrielle with the same family name at, at, at the college already. Um, it's very hard to, get, to give you any um, firm information about how waiting lists work because every year is different and this year is like no other. Um, but the list that we're running at the moment, the one that, that you are on is quite short. Uh, its members can be counted on the fingers of two hands. And given the challenges facing many of the ooh, 60 plus prospectively incoming new greenies this fall in terms of travel plans that many of them will have to make, uh, it seems to me there's a very good chance that we'll be pulling people off that waiting list um, very soon. Um, so I think you're, you're in a good place there, Ratza, and I wouldn't be at all surprised if we don't go beyond that waiting list in due course. And that's a way for me to say that if you haven't applied yet, and I'm not sure whether it's worth the trouble, um, there is some trouble involved, as you can see from the process, but if you're interested in living in Green College, put in an application, uh, the membership committee will review it. If you're approved to live here, we will keep that application live. If we can get you in in the fall, we will. Uh, if we can't, uh, but can offer you a place at the beginning of next year and you're not locked into another contract at that point, you'll have that option. And I suspect in some circumstances, given uh, the odd world that we're all trying to navigate through at the moment, uh, we'll probably keep some acceptances live into the following season, certainly for people in extended programs of um, you know, several years, doctoral students uh, a priority. Uh, so we'll be as flexible in that regard as we always try to be consistent with basic principles of equity and efficiency uh, and safety. Um, so uh, if, you're, if you're wondering whether it's worth the trouble, um, I, I'd encourage you, put in the application. We're notionally full at the moment, but a lot's going to move in the next few weeks and there's going to be a great deal of shuffling and you could well be shuffled in. Um, it's fairly obvious, I suppose, that if you're applying from Canada, your chances of being shuffled in um, might be relatively high, given that most of the obstacles at this point are facing people uh, trying to get here uh, from outside the country. So that, that's that, and there's other stuff which I'll leave, leave to Kristen and Liz in the first place. Sure. Um, so the next question I see, and let me know if I'm skipping over anyone, but the next question is, is there a strict move-in schedule in the first week of September, or is it flexible depending on room availability? Um, I, I do know that there is, um, well, at least in my year, there's been opportunities to move in a few days early um, uh, because uh, resident contracts end on August 24th, as I understand it. Um, I, I can't speak with any sort of authority here, but it, it may be possible to come in earlier than September 1st. Um, would you agree with that, Mark? This is really one for Lynn, but the general rule is yes, when we can, uh, we provide flexibility for people uh, requiring early move-in, but there are limits on that, um, even in an ordinary year, because of the routines that the housing department has for preparing rooms. So um, I'm not gonna make any grand gestures in that regard. Uh, for this kind of question, always be in touch with Lynn Pedro, gc.membership at ubc.ca. Explain to Lynn what it is that you're trying to do. She will let you know what is possible. And as I've said before, we will always try to accommodate, not just in the matter of when you move into residence, but anything else you wanna do around Green College, up to the point where to accommodate you would throw too many other things out of whack to be sustainable. Uh, so try us, ask, be clear about your needs. We'll try to be clear about what we can do and then we'll see. And so I see um, Anant, I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing your name, has asked a similar question. So um, unless you wanted to add to that. Um, um, no, my question has been answered. Thank you so much. Oh, great, great. So. Um, 
Lena asks, can one become a member of Green College and join its activities if I didn't get the chance to live there? Um, are you uh, referring to like attending college events as a UBC student living elsewhere? Because uh, we do have free public events that are pretty much open to anyone. There are like only a few resident um, exclusive events, but um, our community is very open to, um, to people seeing what we're doing here at Green College. Um, and that might be complicated, of course, by the fact that uh, the pandemic has forced us to not physically gather together, but I, I'm sure the college has some virtual events where you could attend. Does, does that answer your question, Lena? Oh, great, great. Um, Liz, do you see any other questions that haven't been answered yet? Those were the only questions I saw. Okay. Um, and unless anyone has more. <laughs> I had one. Um, okay. Uh, so for students that are gonna be elsewhere over the summer, like if they're doing research or if they're doing field work or whatever, is there still a minimum, a minimum amount of time that they need to be living at the college? Or like, what is the policy for students who are gonna be outside the country or in, in elsewhere for a certain period of time? Shall, shall I take that? Because it's a tricky one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, that's a very smart question. Um, because naturally, many of the programs uh, that people are on here do require them to be away uh, for, for extended periods. In cases where you're being away from Green College is part of a required element of your degree program, and your home department will, will confirm that to us, uh, and more importantly, to the housing department, uh, you, you, could, you, can, you can travel and be away without still being due for rent to UBC housing. You can also, in normal circumstances, let's leave the COVID specific arrangements just to, to one side for the moment, you can also get a deal on uh, the meal plan. Now, maybe this is where the maintenance issue actually comes up. Um, the Green College Dining Society, which provides the food service at the college, as well as providing catering for uh, other events when we're hosting visitors at the college is in fact a private uh, entity run by the, the resident members of the college. Uh, that's another of the rather unique things about uh, the college. We have our own kitchen uh, and student members typically as members of the um, dining society board on behalf of the society of students living at the college and others living at the college run that kitchen. There's an executive chef for the day-to-day -day management, but the responsibility ultimately uh, is with the dining society, which is a college society. Uh, because of the scale on which we operate, um, we can't afford to have people just going away and going off plan. So there is a certain minimum level of maintenance payment to the dining society that in normal circumstances, you are obliged to pay. We can provide detail of this. Um, it's, it's not usually onerous, but it is a consideration. We also have provision in, the, in cases where you need to travel, but it's not for an in internship or something else specified by your program. It's, it's more or less an option that you're taking in consultation with your academic advisors. We have a scheme to provide rent relief from a college uh, fund for those needing to be away from the college for extended periods for academic uh, reasons. There's an application process, and as a rule, people who need a month, or in some cases two months on that special provision, are able to get it. So we do whatever we can to facilitate your being away if you need to be away for good reasons, but uh, there's no getting away from the fact you're signing on to a fairly stringent standard UBC 12-month housing contract, and that would be the same if you weren't living at Green College. And there's this additional interesting wrinkle that you're buying into the Green College Dining Society, which is basically a food co-op. And if you and a bunch of others go away, that puts an unbearable burden on the people who stay. So there are limits to how free we can be with that resource. That, that, that was actually a really leading question. 
Uh, thank you. I hope, I hope the answer is just clear enough for people to go on with. There are, there are some niceties to the business of leaving at Green College in order to, to sustain this rather anomalous style of community. Uh, we have to do some fancy footwork here and there. And some of that does take a bit of explaining. Thanks for your patience. Yeah, thank you so much. That was really helpful. You're welcome. All right, well, are there any other questions? And let me underline a point that I think Liz or Kristen already made. Uh, if you decide not to apply to Green College or if in the event uh, we're not able to admit you this year, uh, the college is a UBC wide amenity. In normal circumstances, just about all of our academic and artistic programming is open, not just to people at UBC, but to the general public. Uh, so if you can find your way to the college, and luckily for us, only about 1.5% of the UBC population ever does find its way to the college or we'd be overwhelmed. Um, but even if you're not living here, if there are things going on here that you'd like to join in with, um, we're always pleased to see people uh, from the outside world. And you're, wel you're welcome to stay for dinner as well. Uh, it's a fairly straightforward matter of booking in for dinner and then you can hang out with our resident members and be a kind of uh, virtual greenie. Um, I mean, this would apply particularly if your family circumstances just make it impossible uh, for you to live at the college or if for other reasons, uh, you can't do that. Um, we, we, we want people to come over. Um, so please keep, keep that in mind if at the end of this uh, hour, uh, you decide uh, you can't just move in or if uh, for, for one of a host of reasons, we can't invite you in straight away. Um, uh, Irene asks, would we have to report to the college if we are taking a weekend trip or doing a short trip to visit family? Um, no, no, no. Mm -hmm. no. Yeah. But we do like to know if you're taking an extended trip, uh, not because we'll share that information at all widely, um, but because you know, the college and the university do have some responsibilities for the well-being of students and others here under contractual arrangements. And if you disappear, it can lead to embarrassing publicity. And I say that somewhat flippantly, but, but we've been reminded recently uh, that this can be um, a, a really serious concern. So uh, just, as you, um, just, just as you would in any other circumstances, let somebody maybe know if you were taking an extended trip in this case, we'd always appreciate it if you'd let Lynn or someone else in the office know uh, that if people come asking for you or if um, there's, a, there's a real need to contact you, we at least know that you're away and haven't just um, fallen down a hole. But you can, we don't, we're, we're not, the college is not monitoring uh, your activities. People do break out. My, my standard line when I see a greenie somewhere else than the college is say, hey, how did you get out? but they break out all the time. They, they are brilliant escap escapologists, most of them, and it's essential for their well-being that greenies get out as much as possible. So yes, do please plan, plan to take weekends away from the college. It will be a healthier place for everyone if you do. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Um, uh, Nihal asks, is it permissible for students to keep microwaves, ovens, and an electric stovetop inside the room? Um, many residents do have microwaves, but ovens and stovetops would, I believe, be not, uh, not acceptable because of fire hazards. And yeah, generally it's, uh, you know, a microwave, people will keep a kettle, um, but uh, do you want to say more, Kristen, about how um, efficient the local fire service is? Yes, I do. <laughs> yes, um, I, I managed to have a mishap with my microwave um, and had a, a visit from the fire department. Everything was fine. But uh, yes, th they were very efficient in their, in their uh, arrival time. So that's, uh, another, that's another plus point. The fire department is only you know, three minutes drive by fast fire engine away. So, you know, if, if, if anyone does have an accident, 
And Kristin is only the second or third person in my time as principal to have made a serious attempt to burn the college down. <laughs> These attempts are not, the, the previous one actually was much more carefully planned and, and, and had a, would, would, have worked, would have worked. Um, but we come back to that another day. Um, but no, the, the fire service is close by. So are the RCMP. We've got everybody um, backing us up. Thanks, Kristen. Mm -hmm. um. And just in case you didn't also get a sense of the academic seriousness of everybody living here, um, listen, listen, Kristen, I'm not, uh, Kristen I'm, aren't giving this away, but Green College is full of nerds from the, from the, princi from the principal upwards. So um, don't have any fears on that score. Um, if you're the kind of person whose mind, body and spirit are, are really highly academic and intellectual, you will find congenial company here. Um, it's, not, it's, not, it's not only about partying on Wreck Beach and whipping St. John's College at a, at a, a range of Olympic sports. Um, all of the stuff you would expect in a university in terms of academic overinvestment and overachievement uh, is represented here. So. And I, I will add to that, even in COVID, um, because of course, Kristen had a very different experience than I did. I came here smack dab in the middle and like did not meet anyone and still honestly have trouble remembering faces. Um, but even then, when I walk to go pick up a dinner or something, I will be stopped and listen into a conversation most recently um, by one of our po uh, postdoctoral students talking about like the um, philosophical issues of artificial intelligence while cleaning the CK. I have um, had like the absolute delight of listening to one of my colleagues talk about indigenous communities and data collection and that intersection. Um, if you run into me, I will talk to you about the Etruscans. Even if you do not want to hear about them, I will tell you them anyway. Um, unfortunately, but true. Um, oh, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Um, I did a guest lecture at Langara um, on one of the Etruscan gods, Aplu, and I am glad someone did enjoy that. <laughs> Cool. I was wondering if you were an archaeology student because I heard the word fieldwork. Um, so that all this to say, uh, it is absolutely an incredible environment, um, especially because, especially, keep saying especially, Liz. Um, I am an academic despite my frequent duplications of words here. Even in this environment, I think it's really easy for grad students to like get in their head, especially when the classes have been online and you are literally in very nice four walls, but still four walls. Um, so there are times where you feel so stuck in your discipline and absolutely overthinking everything. Um, and that's when I was able to go to Kristen and go study in Graham House. And then we would take a trip to Rain and Shine Ice Cream and just help you get out of your head, um, whether that is to listen to um, archival discussions and cataloging ideas to artificial intelligence. Um, so all of that serves as a really, really awesome springboard for ideas that will only get better as more students come in. Um, and I'm really, really excited to, to meet all of these new greenies because right now it's, it's fairly empty. So it's going to be really exciting in the fall. Yeah, when I first heard that Green College's motto was ideas and friendship, I thought, <laughs> what a load of BS. <laughs> and the, the terrific thing about this place is every year you get to believe in it all over again. So um, if, you, if you don't believe in it, give it, give it, a, give it a try. It, 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 it might work for you if, if, if ideas and friendship mean anything to you. Uh, the, the college usually delivers, I think, in that respect. I'm so shocked we don't have a Latin motto. That, that's a point of some contention historically, <laughs> Liz. I have, been, I have been ruthlessly mocked for slipping Latin into public <laughs> college over the years. I'm very careful about it these days. But if you and Louis or Louis want to change that, 
come, you know, get, get on it. I'll, I'll be with you. We'll have a Latin table. Oh boy. Um, as someone who's not great at it. Um, I just want to briefly address Lena's question. Can residents apply to become resident advisors at Green College? Um, a question which I, of course, am going to just shove right over to, question, uh, to Kristen. Um, well, my question, Lena, are you referring to the Green Lanterns? Um, our sort of peer advisors? Um, can I leap in here? I think what, what Lena is thinking is of the model that operates elsewhere at UBC and other universities where oh. dual residences have student residence advisors. We don't have that system here um, because in that system, the residence advisor reports up to an administrator in the housing department. Um, because Green College is a community with an average age of, of, of resident member, usually between 26 and 27, we really do take rather seriously the fact that this is a, uh, a consensual arrangement among, among, an, among adults and we don't have um, insider trustee residence advisors reporting up to the office. Instead, we create, uh, or the resident members create, uh, this slew of committees to take care of business and of people's health and well-being. And the Green Lanterns is a, a crucial uh, committee within those committees because it's the one that provides this informal and non-professional peer support service. Otherwise, I should add at this point, UBC has an excellent array of counseling and support services for students who have need of them. And the Green Lanterns, as well as um, uh, the office staff are able to make referrals um, and to support uh, and accompany uh, members of the college in uh, creating those contacts uh, if, they, if they need them. But we, we don't have a residence advisor role uh, of the kind that exists at other uh, halls of residence, dormitories, uh, residences in, 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 well, at UBC and in other universities. But there's plenty of things you can do if you want to get good community service on your CV. Uh, you won't get that line, but there's a bunch of other uh, things that we need every year we need people to do to make the college work. Well, I see it's 928. So if there's maybe one more question, um, we can answer that. Otherwise, um, thanks so much for, you know, attending this webinar, and spending some time with us greenies. Thank you, Kristen. Thank you, Liz. Thank you, everybody, for, for being this interested. Um, you know how to reach us. Any more questions um, going forward, be in touch. Um, and uh, if you don't check in in the fall, uh, come by as soon as you can. And the best of luck to you wherever you are and whatever you're doing over the next few weeks uh, and uh, with your academic work and the rest of your lives uh, going forward, too. Thank you. <laughs>